Greetings, everybody. Um, apologies for keeping you waiting. Um, I know some of you might have a lot to do on a Saturday. Uh, greetings. Welcome to this very last session of ArtSet um, for the time being. My name is Zipo Daily. I'm the curator of the program, and I'm also the host of these sessions. Um, I'm here with my colleagues and creators of the content that we've been reviewing for the past nine weeks. Abdul Kada Ahmed Saheed and Bridget Thompson, as well as Yonalisa Jacobs is also here. She's on the technical side of things. Um, for those that are logging in for the very first time, ArtSat is a program of the Art and Ubuntu Trust. It's an online program aimed at art and culture teachers, uh, visual art teachers, students of the arts, artists and community um, art center facilitators, where we showcased the South African arts past and present film series a series of 15 films that introduce an understanding of the root of South African aesthetic. And this film is produced and directed by Abdul, Bridget, and the late Tingan Kaba. So on this platform, uh, we've introduced my manuscript published by the Art and Ubuntu, and we've hosted exhibitions here on the Zoom platform. Uh, hi, Mr. Tony Sidras. Thank you for joining us all the way in the USA. <laughs> So we've introduced um, a manuscript that uh, Atom Ubuntu Trust published. We've also um, exhibited uh, the work of Ndadeli Fifi Tladi here on this platform uh, with an exhibition, It is time for the Oasis to wander into streams, which we held here on AdSet's program in 2021. We also held another event in association with Concord Trust, celebrating artworks donated by Atom Ubuntu to the Constitutional Court Art Collection. That was held also in 2021. And the artworks include um, Tap Three by the Master Weaver, the late Brad Joan Glovo, a video artwork by Abdul Kadam Ahmed Sahid, and both works are interpretation of Ms. Mangoba's La Sesche, or The Ancestor, as well as Dorothy Randall's Bust of, en of Ms. Mangoba. Um, we also find previous sessions um, on there. Uh, if you go on the Art and Ubuntu Trust website, you will see links of all the films uh, screenings that we held in the past. There are about 20 sessions or 19 sessions, 20 sessions actually to be exact. You find links to the sessions um, on the website. And also if you go to the, to, to us, pardon me, to YouTube channel of Art and Ubuntu Trust, you will be able to see all the other previous sessions including uh, sessions on music of uh, Robbie Janssen, uh, Brother Louis Muhulu. Um, we have literary sessions on late Ndate Gura Betze Hositile. We've had um, uh, sessions on Brad Charles Sukai Ngosi, Omar Bacha, and Soul Blind. So if you head off there uh, during the festive season, you will be able to see all 20 um, series that we've showcased here on this platform called AdSet. But today, it's a very interesting day. Um, we have a beautiful program, and we will kickstart this program for the day shortly. But before we do that, I'd like to encourage everybody to participate. If you have a question, don't be afraid to raise your hand or unmute yourself when you see the opportunity. Or you can drop your questions on the on the chat box um, down below, um, so everyone can engage in the sessions. I'm excited to see old friends uh, that we haven't seen in the past two years. That said, uh, greetings to Imru. <laughs> um, I'm very excited to be spending the next two hours with you. For today's session, we've uh, merged two films, two sessions, a film screening and discussion of jazz conversations. And jazz conversation being one of, of um, the 15 parts for the series on South African art past and present that I mentioned earlier. Um, together with an introduction, Imru, you have a hand. Can you hear me? Can everybody hear me? I'm just waving. I'm so not supposed to be. I'm supposed to be hiding. I'm just waving. No. <laughs> to hear you. from you. <laughs> Thank you for waving. joining. It's been so long. Um, so as I've said, we've merged two sessions, the jazz conversations, as well as... Um, Defining South African music, which is manuscripts um, 
which can be read alongside the SAAPP films and is a con contribution on the discourse of South African music. Um, my colleague Bridget will do an introduction of the manuscript um, you know, in the second session at about 3 p.m. Um, so just before we hear from the speakers of defining South African music, it's a full house today, or it should be, <laughs> as we have about eight speakers. Bratoni uh, Sidras is here. Peggy Koza is here. Snazum Chemula is here. Uh, I don't think uh, Kirsten Skippers, but I hope to see her very soon. Uh, we have Matthias Katushabe. We should have two more Jews. Hi, Kirsten. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Um, we'll have Kwane Lesotibo. Thank you for being here. Uh, Tulima Josie, also here. And uh, lastly, we have uh, an, an, a video recording by Numpundu Kalu Vajanchis, who couldn't make it here today, but she's contributing with a video, which we will play a little bit later on. So to kickstart the session, uh, we're going to play the jazz conversation uh, uh, short film, and then we're going to come back and hear from all that, from our four guests um, of the session, Tony um, Sidras, Kirsten Skippers, Matthias Galushabe, and uh, Peggy Koza, before we head off to the next session. All right. Thanks, Onilisa. Could you play the video? And Mm -hmm. Thank you. Welcome back, everybody. Um, this is the part of the session where you get the chance to talk. Um, uh, I hope you enjoyed hearing from our legends, some of whom are no longer with us in the flesh, uh, but whose music continues to live on to, you know, in a lot of people, people that they've mentored. Um, and also the music that they've left us uh, continues to live. But uh, we do have someone here with us who is in the film uh, and is here in the flesh, Rabeke Koza. Welcome. Um, I don't usually do longish introductions of people, but because we have a variety of speakers today, it will be nice to um, just give a short introduction of each speaker. I'm going to start with Rabeke Koza, who's played the African jazz pioneers uh, Winston Makugungozi, Renee McLean, uh, Victor Dolne, just to name a few. Um, Rabeki's musical influences are many. His grandmother played the Jewish harp and harmonica um, and enriched him with the tradition of Zulu music, which he then found in Puzushugela, Gadelimyama, and Ghana Ziam Fever. He was also influenced by people at weddings, funerals, in the streets and shibins, other influences including Philip Tabani, Alan Quella, Wes Montgomery, Barney Castles, Kenny Barrel, Joe Pass, name of him. <laughs> Becky was a musical director of the South African production of drums, a fiction account of uh, the Raising Sophia Town, which premiered in 2004. It's good to have you, Bra Becky, and we're looking forward to uh, hearing from you shortly. We also have Sinazom Chembla who is based in East London, and Alice in the Eastern Cape. Snazo is studying towards a PhD that attempts to work through their interest in how sound is constituted in the archive and ways of listening. Snazo is also an archivist at the National Heritage and Cultural Studies Center at the University of Forte. Our next guest um, for Jazz Conversations is composer, pianist, arranger and film composer Kirsten Skippers. Uh, Skippers graduated in, uh, from the South African College of Music at UCT over a year ago, right? If I'm not wrong. Um, they are currently enjoying performing around Cape Town with their content. Um, I've been enjoying your uh, mid flight track, <laughs> Kirsten, this past year. So welcome to you also. I'd also like to welcome Matthias Katushabe, Katushave is a singer, songwriter, and producer who grew up in Kaila and is now based in Kabeha in the Eastern Cape. Um, Katushave wrote his master's thesis in musicology on the topic of South African music genre. Um, throughout his university journey, he found himself majoring in jazz 
getting to cut his teeth as a singer at the pre prestigious Isisusa and Standard Bank um, Joy of Jazz Festival. It's good to have you, Matthias. Um, I'd also like to give a short introduction to a person uh, who's not currently here, but who's um, recorded a video for us. Uh, just a composer and educator, Nomfundo Kaluva Jakis, has released two albums under the uh, Universal Music Group. She holds a master's degree in jazz that is from UCT with a dissertation titled The Analysis of the Musical Style of Miriam Makeba. Nomfundo is the former vice chairperson of Sambro Foundation Board, whose interest is vested in the development and funding of arts education, as well as nurturing a vibrant music scene in South Africa. She's also a senior lecturer in jazz studies at the College of Music at the University of Cape Town. We honored to have Tony Sidras with us because, um, but Tony is very far, uh, um, he's in Western US and the time difference is 10 hours. Uh, but Tony and I initially thought he'd contribute a video in today's session of defining South African music, which is the second half. But due to technical glitches, uh, you know, that couldn't happen and had to log in. Uh, like it for us. Uh, so thank you so much, Tony Sidras. So instead of keeping him for the whole hour, yeah, uh, I just thought maybe it might be best to slot him in the segment. Um, but Tony, you're welcome to stay longer. But in case you have to rush, uh, you can please join us for the jazz conversation. Uh, Tony Sidras was born in Moses River in Cape Town in 1952, a multi-instrumentalist mainly known for playing the accordion. Sidras became a key session player in the Cape Jazz circuit, working with artists such as Jonathan Butler, Winston Ngongongozi, Robbie Jansen, Russell Herman, Basil Moses, to name a few. After touring inside South Africa, Sidras relocated to Khabarone in Botswana in the early 1980s. At that stage, Botswana was a home away from home for many exiles, and it was here that he met trombonist Ben Linda Jonas Gwangwa. Gwangwa was the musical director of the Amantla Ensemble of the ANC, which Sidras joined, traveling not only in Africa, but also in Europe, Canada, and Brazil. Um, thank you so much for making time to join us. Um, I think maybe let's try to make things interesting and start with Sinazo's um, uh, introduction. Uh, Sinazo, you're not a musician and Prophet Stroy had uh, beef there with people who anal analyze um, jazz, they're not musicians. So uh, let's start with you. <laughs> let's hear what you have to say. And then um, maybe move back to Raya Peki. Welcome, Sinazo. We can't hear you. Please unmute yourself. You are unmuted. Yonelisa, you do not mute everybody. We can't hear Sinazo. She is unmuted. Maybe she must try to mute and unmute. Hmm. This thing I'm happened. And push her. Oh, hey. Oh, oh, maybe your volume on the on the what on the computer someone is saying something about volume. Oh, you know what you could do also? You just try and log log out and log in. Um, to join us, and we'll just go on to the next speaker if that's okay with you. Okay, while uh, we, Snazzle tries to fix the problem, Rapeki, greeting. Hello. Hi. Can you fix your computer? Can we see your whole face? Oh, me? Wait yeah. a minute. What is it doing? Yeah, can you tilt maybe your machine? Yeah. Yeah, Bob. Njan, probably. Yeah, Bob, I'm going to Njan. Right. It's good. Yeah. Mm, all right, it's good to see yes. you. Yes, I'm so happy. I'm so happy to see uh, Tony Citras here. 
Becky, Becky, man. Yeah, Can you hear me? You know, yes. Hey, yes. what's up, on, man? Hey, how's hey, it? Man. You know, I'm in Cape hey. Town. I'm in Cape Town. Listen, the last time I see you was in New York, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I can't believe I thought I was going oh, I'm in Cape Town now. I'm in Cape Town and I thought I was going to see you. And the next thing yeah, you're listen, you must, you must think, you must, I know you've been playing at the gallery there. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yes, yes. yes. I, I met the gallery. I met the at the guest yes. house. Yes. Right. I mean, oh. <laughs> yeah. It's so beautiful to see you, man. Yeah, no, uh, thanks. But very I much. Put, hey, you remind yeah, me of thank you. something. You know who I saw? I saw Joe Finn, the drum. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. And he sang the songs to me, the songs that we used to play with him. Some of them that I'm no longer even playing today. Oh, wow. He just wow. Sang. Yeah, I saw him in this club. It's called Touch of Madness. Touch of Madness, <laughs> yeah. Observatory. It's an yeah. there. Yes, it's and I'm obs. looking at this guy. I'm looking at his face looks like something I know. And he's looking at me after maybe an hour, after 40 minutes, he says, I'm born. You don't own born. You see, when he said, I'm not seeing him, the name just came back right away. I said, yep. No, you have from. Hey, it's a Deben boy originally. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. didn't know. Deben. That's why he used, Deben, to, eh? he used to cook a storm of curry, that guy. Oh, <laughs> very hot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so good to see you, man. Yes, thanks very you much. Look. Yes. <laughs> wow, this is something. Oh, this is it's almost like I'm out of the country. <laughs> wow. Wow. Thank yes. you, my sister. Yes. Making yes. this possible. No, I'm very glad uh, to be part of this. I can't even remember when this was recorded, uh, but I remember oh, wow. doing a Panera Chaba, with Panera Chaba. Yeah. Uh, accompanying a poetry by uh, by uh, uh, Hosisile, uh, Brawili. Yes, I did an album with him. I also did an album with him and Rene at uh, uh, on the Roman Studio. Yeah, and one hundred twenty fifth, it was me and Hosisile and Rene at uh, Honored Coleman Studio. There's an album there, we recorded the whole album. We must get that still. Yeah, I must Let's get see. that, I must get that. Man, are you still playing? I, I can't believe Cape Town without you. You know, <laughs> I'm, Don't worry, I, I, I most probably after the Christmas season, I'll be at home for a while, then I have to go back to New York. I play with the Fred Gill of the band, man, Henry Fred Gills, you know, free jazz, reminds me of Malombo. <laughs> oh, yes. yes. Yeah. I'm doing a, a revisit with the uh, Fred Gills music in March next year. So I'll mm -hmm. see you at home, don't worry. Before okay. that, okay, yeah, I will be for a while. Yeah, I want to try Cape Town for this time. I want to try and leave you must, they, they need you there, they need you there, yeah. you know, yeah. to kick some uh, some butt because you know, uh, Cape Tonians be by the sea, we get lazy, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Must, yeah. Yeah, you must play, play hard. People are walking with ski play. boards all over the place, <laughs> yeah, just, just, just play it very hard so that you know the energy pick the energy yeah. up there. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Thanks very much, man. Yes. I... Yes. Uh, I'm. I'm glad. I was. I was. As I was looking at this video yesterday. I looked at it last night, and it was very interesting to hear uh, Mam Toro to speak and uh, and and Fitzroy. Oh, this. Uh, this is a uh, uh, Mam T. The late. Uh, yeah, the late uh, Mr. Yeah. Dorothy. She used to yeah. come to Brooklyn all the time. Then I then uh, she doesn't have to look. Left or right, I'm standing right in front of her. She comes straight to me. And now we have to put the band together for her, always. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, so I worked a lot with her when she came to New York. Yeah, it was an I honor. I traveled a lot yeah. with, uh, uh, through Africa to, to, to like Zanzibar. Uh, yep. to, uh, which is the other place? I forget the name. Yeah, no, it's Zanzibar. She could mix, she could mix the bakana so much, so beautiful with the jazz. She could, yes, she, yes. she was... You know, I, I realized later on. I realized later <laughs> on that she had a big influence uh, by by Billie Holiday also. But then exactly. she, but she sang it in. Yeah, the, the, it put her own uh, spin on it. 
Very yeah. good. So, uh, you know, they are, I, I, I think people, they mustn't try to, too much to uh, to politicize this thing about, uh, yeah. we, we must be open that uh, jazz is an international thing these days, right? Uh, of course, yes, the, even the word, the, the, it, it came through America, but who was there? It was people from all over the different parts of the continent. That's why today we went there. something called Africa in America. Africa diaspora, you know. So yes. uh, it became a music which actually, uh, which uh, accented improvisation. Now, of course, we can't. You see, say, I like the way you, I like the way you were saying it in when you in that in that uh, interview. They couldn't cut that. They cut everything else from the slaves. But they couldn't cut the sound. Yes. They couldn't yeah. cut the music. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You said it. It's so, 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 so very simple. The way you said it in the interview, I said, yeah, man. They couldn't cut it out of your soul. They you couldn't took it cut with the sound. <laughs> yeah. Because the sound, you man. travel. You travel with wherever you are. And, and, oh, and man. Also, of course, they, they had a very crucial system of, of, no, of making exactly that. People who came from the same uh, tribe or family, they were not, yep. people who were speaking the same dialect were not together. They, they separated them. So they separated, it was, that's what... it was a, a systematically made thing. But what like, how like apartheid. How well like apartheid. How they do with the sound? The sound is in the head. You know, yep. so even, if the, even the person does not have the language in terms of the words, they can still be humming. Yeah. And the whole yeah. idea, the, the whole idea of improvised music, everybody knows that is from the continent, the, that continent. Yep. Uh, yes, but I mean, a, a, a lot of things is that things happened in a different way. Original uh, classical musicians were improvising. <laughs> Uh, and then to keep the music, because the music, the publishing of the music into a score was actually like recording the music, because they did yeah. not have, they could not record the music. So publishing the music was some kind of recording. Now, yeah. but what what the, the 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 people who followed the mistake they made, they made that if I get a music published on a piece of paper. That is actually uh, a recording. Who told yeah. them that it must be played note for note and no nothing else, no commas? You, you, how it got to that? I do not know how it got to that. Into so that you don't change it. I remember, you know, when I was in the states, uh, I took a private lesson with a classical teacher, and <laughs> in one of the pieces that I was doing on on Beethoven. I put at the end. I put on my own ending. Man, oh she, yeah, <laughs> she, the whole school knew about it. She freaked <laughs> out. She said, "What? What is this?" After I finished the song, and then I put an I I I, I at least I put Ooh. an ending. She, she stood on the chair. She said, "What are you doing?" I said, "No, I'm hearing <laughs> other things." Yeah. She said, "What are you hearing?" This is met Mr. Beethoven. <laughs> hear that? This is Mr. Beethoven. <laughs> you know, same thing, you know what? <laughs> same thing happened with George Matibe. You remember the guitarist, Georgie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. George yes, Matibe. Yeah. Yeah, he yeah. had a classical teacher play at Wits and it told yeah, yeah. him, You, as a black man, will never be able to play this <laughs> classical music. But he was teaching him classical music. Oh, <laughs> ridiculous, you know. So, the woman, she said to me, I said no, but I finished the song now. But I'm, I'm putting and I'm, I'm hearing some stuff. She says you can't hear no stuff here. Yeah, this is Mr. Butchavan. The next thing I was <laughs> meeting other students outside. Everybody was laughing and says, "What did the African do? Do what did the African do?" The the matter wow. was very angry then. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that was so, a new school, man. Eh? That know, is a I new mean, school. It was now at uh, at uh, Hartford University. Oh, Hartford and Connecticut. Yeah, Connecticut at Connecticut. Yeah, yeah. yeah. where uh, Otep was there as well. Otep. Uh, Otep was there. Uh, yeah, Otep yeah. was there. McLean 
Was wow, there. baby. Yeah, Jackie McLean is the one who actually invited me after seeing me. Right. And he thought I had a degree in music. I said, and he said, which school did you come from? I said, no, not school, from the kitchen. I said, yes. <laughs> so then he offered me a scholarship. But anyway, yeah. uh, I mean, uh, I, I think when Mom Dorothy right there, when she started talking there, I think really she pinned it on the point when, when she said, uh, today you can't say that uh, the, the, because when you say South African jazz, uh, that is mm. very, you know, that is a very wide uh, scope. Yeah. Because we've got, uh, everybody will come in uh, with a different accentation on that. You see, yeah. you, like you hear Philip Tabane, you hear Malong, yeah. uh, um. you hear Columbus, you hear Ezra, you hear Mankunku, you hear you guys, Tony Citrus, and the, um, the I mean, and, 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 uh, 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 Beckham Seleku. Then, then you hear, yeah, you hear the, the, I was I was at, a few days ago. I saw the people that are playing in the, the carnivals. They are starting to the carnivals. <laughs> the guys, clubs. Oh, you in Cape Town now? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, I see the but guys. The but, they, you know what they were doing? They were they were doing a a hip version of. They were doing what? They wow. were doing a Bob, They were doing a pop money thing. And it took so me see? some time before I hear it was Bob Marley. <laughs> and they like, bring it fast, right? Oh, yeah. shame. There's a horn, there's a saxophone, there's trumpet, there's a, a guy playing a, a, a accordion. It took me some time. I followed them trying to take a oh, picture yeah. until I had that. No, I man, they're playing Bob Marley. This is... <laughs> this is... Buffalo. And the way they're playing it, I and mean, then like, this is... The that's cool. Any piece of music in that tempo, in that yeah, yeah, in, in that tempo, it's uh, it's it's sorry. You know, so it will have uh, different accents, as uh, Rajonas was saying. You know, I was saying, was, was, I love an interview. Saying. But but uh, yeah. what Mandy said to say, oh, okay, what well, actually referring to what I said before is that. There must be when you say jazz, there there must be some improvisation that takes oh, place. Oh yeah, all the time. The, yeah, yeah. That is there's some even in the smallest way or the most elaborate way. There is you you've got freedom to move, to yes. bend, and to shape where you're going. Yeah. And other yeah. music sometimes don't yeah. allow you to do that, but jazz, and especially our way of playing, we have such a big resource. Of where we can come up from the Kanga side, from the Kuma side, from the, yeah, yeah, the Marabi yeah. side, yeah, from the choral side. I mean, oh, yes. we from the hymns, also the hymns, and then there's Apostle, yes, the Zions. There's, she asked me, you know, she asked me how uh, what shaped my artistry. It's all of this we had to uh, become internal and learn from. People like yourself, Bragwangwa, and all of them. That was our school of thought. Yes. So when we leave this country, we are we are we are, we are, we are armored. We have got all the information. Yeah. I always say to students, prepare yourself with your own music here. So when you get there, you got some shit you can play them. You know, yeah. you can yeah, you play them. Got some music that that they going to ask you what is this. Yeah, <laughs> and I prepared myself. Mm. You know, I was I loved our music. There was so much different music here in, in South Africa. You, it's a, like a cookie jar. I mean, yeah. remember, you know, a that's fine. why my be, yeah. that's why my be them people. Uh, I mean, uh, 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 I mean, Sandil, uh, I mean, my be them or uh, Gumedi them. They they realize that. And that's why the music from that East Coast in Durban, you guys. Came yeah. with some heavy stuff, you know, yeah. Malambo and all of that. You know, yeah. that's no, no, that's our is, school of music, man. <laughs> man, it's still even even today. There's still a lot that you hear that in this country. Yeah. That yeah, they, they, we've, we've missed a lot of that. <laughs> you know, there is. We are there to. I there is much to seen in this side. You know, so it's really? funny when then they try to make these collaborations uh, with Europeans where. 
who right. who think this is exotic. It's a way to uh, yeah. <laughs> It's a way Ask Masikela to... about that. Masikela yeah. knows about that. Yeah. Talk yeah. about it. Say, hey, these people, we are, we are very exotic uh, <laughs> people from Af from Africa. <laughs> yeah. It's, 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 but it's, because they didn't know how to, to 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 receive, explain what they are experiencing, even in New York City today, I can play a bakana or a marabi or a fast uh, uh, carnival thing, and it was. What the hell is that, man? I say, that's a moppy. And the one goes, oh, oh, what is a moppy? <laughs> <laughs> and I laugh. I have to explain to him, this is a type of rhythm we play in Cape Town. It's right to, next to the swing. You know, the, the carnival yeah, I, thing is very fast. I'm telling you, uh, and, I, uh, tell them, I tell them, there's a story I tell all the time. Uh, remember in in New York, in, 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 uh, in, uh, at, in Manhattan, 10th Street, uh, yeah. One day, I, I used to go to a jam session there. It's called, uh, it was, there was a jam session there, which was every Monday. And one day, this thing it happened. Mass, it's, at anarchy. At anarchy. anarchy. Ah, remember? You remember that? Yeah. Yep. Anarchy. Yep. Yeah. So one day, I'm, I'm, I go in there, like two o'clock in the morning, I go in, I tune to yep. Muscandi, and I'm playing. Ooh. The guys, the guys from uh, uh, from Burundi, from Mali, they tried um, to go on the drums, and I kept on, I kept on playing the riff, and the guys were coming behind me and and playing the drums, and I was going like this, out. Oh. Like and people were asking, what does he want? And one of Those the night, boys. one of the night, I'm playing, and the drummers was not cracking it, and all hey. of a sudden the beat went. On the on the man, and when I and I started singing without even looking at the bird, I was oh, singing. Shit. At the end of the singing, I turned around. It's Tony Citrus on the drums. <laughs> <laughs> it's Tony Citrus on the drums, because of the accent, he understood the accent, and the guy, the yeah. people was this guy. He's playing another thing now. He's playing, a, and the another time I was playing. They were messing up the tempo, messing up the tempo, and, and, and when it said, I looked around, it was Magito Kuman on drums. And oh! Like, <laughs> so I realized that this thing, as much as simple as it is, it's yeah. not simple to, to, to people who have not heard it, who don't know what's happening. Exactly. So, so, um, yeah, but Tony. Uh, oh, man. <laughs> Sorry, um, that's we my have, whole story right there. <laughs> I'd also like to bring in someone to this conversation yes, because we have yes. some musicians chatting. Oh, we have sure. a very young pianist, Kirsten Skippers, in the house. Kirsten, oh wow! Hi, hi, Kirsten. How is it like? Hi, everyone. The, oh, that, that was so nice. Hi, I have to keep my glasses doing? on. <laughs> <laughs> hi, say Uncle Tony. Hi, cheers, hi, cheers. <laughs> and Becky, hi, everybody. Hi, hi, hi. Proud of you. I'm very proud of you. Thank keep you, playing, thank eh? you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I keep keep playing. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. What's your next, what is your next gig? Um, athletics club in in town. I'm not sure if you know of that venue. I know Becky's also yeah. in Cape Town, as I heard. <clears throat> so Becky, if you um still around at that time and you're not busy, you more than welcome to come down to Athletics Club in Bree Street. When? I know when? Um, the eighth of December. Okay, I'm playing yeah. that tonight. I think I saw you at um with the that that I'm, playing the so I'm playing the solo. I couldn't find the musicians are all. <laughs> Everybody is working. The musicians are so busy. I had five numbers, piano players, five numbers, drummers, five yes. numbers. No oh, sure. And then <laughs> I started, I found, I said, I, I, I'm gone. I was cracking my head, you know. Yes. And, yeah. And that I know. Right. I'm, I'm but we're pleased to have you here. Yeah, yeah. eh? We're very pleased to have you. I wish I stayed longer that night, but I had to. Get yeah. moving again because I also had another rehearsal and yes. so yeah. But thank you for um 
adding me to the conversation. I really um, am appreciative that I was asked. And um, everything that was discussed in the video, like everything really? is on point. I think there is a difference, you know, it's, though improvisation, you know, is a very coherent thing when we take Brazilian jazz or African jazz, and American jazz, the improvisational part, is, it's all about lineage, you know, who we listen to and stuff. But there is very yeah. much a difference between our music and, you know, the music in Brazil, I mean, Southern America and Northern America. And I think it all boils down to lyricism, you know, something that Jonas Guangua said, um, the accent, you know, through the music. So, yeah, but in terms of like improvisation, for me, in my like small, well, my trajectory so far, as a student going into like music full time, I've learned like Lenny just everything. When I learn, when I listen to Becky, um, Seleko, you know, you hear a bit of McCoy, but also Becky sounds like Becky. So that is where the lyricism, half lyricism and half lineage like kind of plays in. So I think that's how I've kind of evaluated, yeah, the music. That's all I have to say. It's important to follow that. I think it's important for you to follow that strand because uh, you have to look and just find your own voice through all of this yeah. stuff we're talking about. That's your originality, your own voice, in a, for lack of a better word, your own, your calling, your passion to have your own original sound. So when you open the first sound that comes out of your mouth or play, Mm -hmm. that's where it happens. The rest of it is all gravy. As, in other words, you put your horn to your mouth or you put your guitar and play the very first few notes. That's where it is. Yeah. So that question came up sometime, uh, with a QA and a writing lyrics. And the person asked, uh, um, how do you write a hit? <laughs> the guy who answered said what I just said, in the first bar, the sound that comes out of your body, that's where it is. First two bars. That's it. The rest, yes. it doesn't matter what happens after that either. Mm -hmm. So that's a feat that we always try as artisans, you know, because when you grab that mic or play, it's, you need to create that vibe or that's you playing there. This is something that's going to it's going to happen now. <laughs> yes, that yes. kind of feeling, and it's a journey. It goes up and goes down, but that's the the end the end game for me. You know, when you take that horn, when you listen to Miles sometimes or Freddie, not Freddie Hubbard, uh, all of them, <laughs> he puts the horn right to his mouth, and the first one, two, three, four notes that comes out already affects you. How is that possible? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, sometimes. Yeah, so it needs to come quick. Yeah. Tony, anyway, when you're back in Cape Town, will you give a workshop? You there. Yeah, <laughs> it's your calling, it's your, it's your originality, and all the stuff that's going on around, all the diversity that what we have in South Africa is, is an archive of. Yes, that, that's stuff another that thing as well. Yeah. Like, um, for me as a student, like, you know, just newly coming out of the institution and going, I mean, I first started within church. And then I went into classical yeah. tech. And then yeah, yeah. at the age of 16, I just went into like, you know, finding jazz and stuff and then slipped into the institution. Um, yeah. And, but I think it was through um, another mentor of mine um, by the name of Mark Franzman. He used to oh, break yeah. down everything. Yeah, he used to break down everything that whole tip, you know, taught him and, <laughs> you know, the, the people, the pianists he would listen to, even horn players. And through that, mm. I realized, you know, there's so much. Even as a yep. South African, like I, I still need to delve deep into, you know, I think many of us, especially like in my generation, like we only yeah. somehow touch the surface of South African music because we are like there's 11, like 11 different official languages, right? So that is like what 11 different regions, you know, and different types of elements. And so I like even Muscandi music and Yep. Yeah, like every other type of, um, how do you say, tribal like music, I still need to 
get myself into and like just delve deeper and I'm still on I'm I'm on that same journey still. <laughs> yes, even you know, I mean the music so, of all the text, you know. When I think of so much things I haven't yet set at the piano to you know mm -hmm. and yeah. But okay, we will, we will, we will, Sorry to cut you there. We still have some time. We will we will come back to you. Uh, I promised the Nazo uh, that she'll be. Thank you next. so much. So <laughs> yeah. don't go don't go anywhere, please. Uh, you can just mute your mics for now. Uh, we listen to Snazo and then I hope people have questions, especially for the musicians. But Tony and Rapeki, you have this chance to ask them questions. Um, so if you're a speaker or a speaker in the next session, you're welcome to join in, ask a question, raise your hand, make a comment. Um, but for now, um, can we see if Snazo managed to sort out a technical glitch? Can you hear Hi. me now? Yeah, it would be nice if we can speak a little bit louder, but we can hear you. Oh, or maybe I can. Hi. Hi. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um. Wow. This is amazing because um all that is being said here is is actually just creating all sorts of of thoughts in my head, and I think what would that do? What Tony Sidras just said about um, jazz and what it affords, kind of the freedom to move, to bend. Um, I think that's where I would start um, when you ask the question of maybe why is jazz important to me? Um, and I think for me, it, it's what it enables um, for us in society, um, kind of taking cue from all these musicians, these great musicians and other thinkers, because musicians are also thinkers, you know, and I think they give us a language. They give me at least a language. Um, and Umamu Dorothy also said it in the, in the film um, that jazz is a feeling. So there's like something about it that's productive for me in my own work as a historian, as you know, because then it gives one kind of a, a method to work with, uh, because you find that as a historian, uh, methods are limited within a certain mode, you know, of thinking or writing as like the primary way of doing things. So if one then brings in those elements of the freedom for one not to be, to, to be able to hear other things, to see in other ways and to think in other ways. And I think it challenges um me at least and um there's a scholar herbert McCuse. i think he's like um kind of a marxist and he talks about the potential for art um uh, the kind of liberatory aesthetic of of art and i think even with jazz there is that kind of sounding of liberation uh it shows that yeah. it shows us how to be free in, in 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 a you know in a way that is not written and prescribed so I think that's just what I am getting from these conversations. Um, and for Uta Dupeki, I would like to find out how does he kind of feel about hearing himself kind of speaking at a different time about kind of this, um, this discussion. So it's kind of like having a conversation within a conversation. So for me, I think it's just also adding other elements to this discussion um, that are quite you know, challenging, you know, for us to listen in different ways and at different tempos, you know. Um, I guess I don't have the language of a musician, but uh, yeah, I guess one other thing that I would like to add is kind of the, the, the thing about learning and, and teaching. So the musicians are, are teaching me uh, different ways of, of of thinking about my own work and I guess one doesn't have to be a musician to be able to feel um, certain things so and I think what Uta Fitzroy says about kind of the history like writing South African jazz he's spot on because you find that Nyani it's written from a point of view of people who don't necessarily, who are not necessarily artists, you know, and they speak on behalf of. And I think that's always been the critique of kind of um, about the academics and people who are, you know, in that space of, you know, the university. 
uh, in other fields as well, in other disciplines, not just, I guess, in, in, in writing music, um, even historians, mm -hmm. like we are complicit in this, you know, of speaking on behalf of people. Um, but I think for me, where I want to shift um, as a historian who's also not really disciplined in the, in the in kind of in the history discipline, because I come in from different spaces, um, I, and I guess there I'm coming to challenge that idea of being the authority, um, you know, through the written word and and trying to actually learn um, in, in kind of other ways that uh, kind of jazz musicians are expressing themselves and how that I can bring and foreground those voices into the discussion rather than using people as kind of sources and extracting information, you know. Uh, so, I mean, it's a challenge. Uh, it's an ongoing challenge. I'm not saying that I've kind of made made it far, but yeah, I think just try, trying to move beyond extracting, 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 and actually learning um, more and having a dialogue um, as kind of what uh, David Scott says, you know, when he thinks about Stuart Hall as a person that operates in a mode of kind of reciprocity and there's a generosity there. So those are the ethics that I guess we need to bring into the space of kind of the academy. Uh, not because mm. I think there is that kind of things that I'm learning as, as I am engaging with the music, with the musicians own voices and trying to bring that uh, kind of to the fore. And lastly, maybe just to quickly um, before I, I, I leave, because <laughs> I get anxious even speaking about, you know, all these big, you know, discussions. Uh, I'm thinking about um, this idea of, of kind of jazz and origins and, okay, whether it comes from here or there. Uh, I'm thinking about just my own work uh, where I've been engaging with uh, um kind of music because I work in an archive as well at the University of Forte. So they, there's like liberation archives. So you find that there are different um, artists who are in exile. So their music is there in the archive, you know, so it's always marginal. <laughs> so what I'm trying to do is actually to say that, okay, how then do we bring uh, the other ways that people were doing the work of liberation into the fore besides like the kind of political, because that is also political, but besides kind of the political speeches, statements and all the other things, just to also put that as, equally important for us to listen to and to learn from. So what um, Johnny Gianni said in, in one interview with uh, Kaganov in Exile, so he was talking about this concept of free jazz and he kept referencing Umran um, to say that he was kind of a mentor, a teacher to them. And he used to use a term called the foul run. And f the foul run is, is kind of another way to say free jazz, but it was even before the notion of free jazz existed in their heads. And even if before they knew that there was avant-garde, there was this, but that thing was already being done, you know, in a different space uh, by Omra and others. So I think for me then it just uh, kind of gives me the idea that actually these things were happening at different spaces at different times because he's talk uh Jan is also talking about a family of black music so the diaspora has like all sorts of these kind of different articulations of 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 free jazz and what that means to different people so I think that there's a lot that I could say but I think I would leave it at that I'm really 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 grateful to be in this platform to have a conversation because it's really a learning kind of experience for me as well thank you <laughs> Thank you, Snazo. Mm -hmm. uh, before before mm -hmm. Brabegi answers you, ne? before Brabegi answers your question, you had a question to Brabegi asking how it feels like for him to revisit this conversation, you know, in real time. So uh, before he answers that, I would like to go to Matthias, who's also a guest for today and is also and would like to comment. I uh, wrote something on the chat box that he'd like to uh, comment on the uh, point of observers. Um, writing on behalf of participants. Um, also, there's a so uh, Matthias, you can unmute yourself, but uh, if 
I'm not sure if everybody is reading the chats, but um, Bridget also has a, a comment there about um, this question. Uh, he says, she says, Hi, Rima, the Ethiopian filmmaker says that film language is triangular in that it's made up of, filmmaker, of the filmmaker, the audience, the critic or interpreter. So this is probably true for other art forms, including music. Um, so, Matthias, if you have something else to say on that note. Um, I, you are unmuted, but we can't hear you. You're probably experiencing the same problem with um, Snazo. Do you mind putting on maybe earphones? Can you hear me by any chance? It sounds better already. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Hooray. <laughs> I'm not sure what these devices are up to, but thank you so very much for having me. This is a gigantic hello and uh, all the blessings that the world has for everybody who's sitting here within the chat. Before you, or in the conversation rather, before you right now is, uh, as was said, Matthias Katushabe or Rangasi, as it is I'm affectionately known through the music spaces. I am somebody who had the privilege and honor to get to do my master's qualification at the university, or rather the Nelson Mandela University. Graduated last December, and my thesis was, or rather my dissertation was on the social political climate and essential growth of bum music. But the reason it is I got to that was whilst doing my undergrad, whilst doing my diploma and my degree, I went to notice that at least in tertiary spaces, there is actually a gigantic deficit, a gigantic problem when it comes to archiving our music, mainly because we seemingly only have a very linear way of telling our stories within music, at least in the South African context, in that we have participants and we have observers. We don't necessarily have essentially, or in like a large number, enough people or many people who happen to kind of fit within an in-between sort of space, or as they would call it, a participant observer. And this is where my research mm. came in because I myself am somebody who was actually told by my supervisor, Dr. Glenn Holtzman, who is a Cape Town native himself, went and he told me that I myself sit within the participant observer space as somebody who not only listens oh. and relates the music to myself in that manner, but I'm somebody who produces God myself. I'm somebody who has a language with people who are gum producers themselves. I'm somebody who just so happens to fit in a space that allows me to like Umam Dorthimasuka was speaking on Rest Her Soul within the video of how do you get to write the feeling? One thing that I could, I guess, think would be as a suggestion would be to encourage people who also happen to be participants, but have the eye, have the language, have the feeling behind writing or speaking on these feelings that we have, trying to break things down, trying to help people understand exactly what it is that we are feeling because it is indeed very difficult to describe a feeling but i'm somebody who is of the opinion that if it is that somebody has the proclivity to do something as rather complex to some as explain a feeling then they shouldn't be shy about how it is they'll be seen if anything a lot of things start from rocky and rough places i mean they're very place that we sit right now as musicians who are deep within jazz or maybe not so much within jazz or whatever it is know that there are very rough places that we start we don't just out of nowhere come and know exactly what to do on a drum kit on guitar on piano we all learn from some way so the suggestion i would have is more people like I guess I found myself as in being a participant observer, as is known in the academic spaces, be given that onus, given that space, given that encouragement to come out because 
it is obviously very, very important that people like Usisnazo over here exist who archive the music and are enthusiasts of it. And in that manner can give us the information that is so needed. But it is also not lost on us that our feeling as musicians has to be captured in a way that does justice to both. And both can be done. I don't want to use myself as a form of bragging, as a way of showing that it indeed can be done. Someone did an entire master's in gum music. I mean, imagine that. But it is definitely not lost on me that there are a lot of people, great reception from a number of people who showed me that this was a possibility that they now know exists because I did it has shown me that it's very important and I didn't even get it from nowhere I saw this deficit and saw that this feeling is explainable lucky for me very fortunate of me our department brought us a slew of amazing musicians that showed me that it was possible the likes of Dadu Makoi Mkubata, Dadu Lex Fuchane, Professor Dizu Blaikis, the brother himself, Dr. Ndutu Zomakatini, such amazing musicians have come through our university, through master classes, through performances. And it was me sitting there seeing how passionately they explain what they're saying and how I guess I as a musician can understand it. But then how I knew that it shouldn't be that we as musicians understand it alone, because what's going to happen is someone who can understand it from a different perspective, will explain it well, but not well enough to capture exactly what we as musicians mean. So I think one suggestion that I have in terms of trying to, I guess, make it a triangular experience within music is to help encourage people who feel they might have the, I'll call it the bone for lack of a better word, to writing towards or to documenting because writing is not the only way. I mean, it was through writing that classical music became the very note for note, bar for bar musical practice that it became, killing the beauty of improvisation, killing the beauty of coming with who it is you are and what you have into the music. We have a plethora of ways of capturing things here we are making one right now through this video people can write it through songs people can make posts through various social media that exist we are no longer as limited as scribbles on a piece of paper we have so much to us we don't even need to go through things such as a university space because if we have the knowledge and we again start from wherever it is we are and can learn along the way from people who have this information, have the muscle for it, then perhaps we would get to a better place in forms of archiving. Instead of trying to say that the traditional observer, observing a participant should be done away with because it too has its own merit, that we add people who can be called participant observers into the mix to help us get the fullest picture as much as possible to actually getting down what it is that we as musicians have to say. And that's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. Thank you, Matthias. Um, we, we still have a whole video presentation by Sis uh, Nomfundo Alova. But before we play that video, uh, Prapegi, would you like to respond to the question that Snazo had? Um, then immediately after that, we'll go to Nomfundo's um, presentation. And if there are questions after Nomfundo's presentations, we go to them. If not, no questions, then we move to defining South African music with Bridget. Yes, yes. Uh... I only I, I saw this uh, uh, video last night, you know, very late at night, and I was watching it and and listening to it, and I found out I mean the in the it's some years ago that that was done, and and it was immediately after we were actually performing uh, with Brabani and and Lex Fuchane and uh, and uh, Brawili doing the poetry. It, it really struck me very well that uh, I realize again, I, I can stamp it now, that uh, it is very important uh, to talk from the heart uh, when you are talking, when you are opening your mouth, to talk from the heart uh, and to talk honestly. And as, as Tony was, as, 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 as Citrus was saying that, 
the first note that comes. You know, there is. Uh, I'm, 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 I felt very, very, very glad that uh, I was very nervous listening to that at first. But when I heard what I was saying, uh, I noticed it's something that I stand with. I stand for even today or or, or any time. Uh, whether it be can be wrong or can be right, that's how that's how I perceived it, and that's how I articulated it. I was really, really uh, uh, very happy about it, and it inspired me to think. And especially these days, there there is some uh, guy who's writing me, is phoning me a lot. He's trying to is I think he's doing a, a, a master's degree. Uh, but somewhere he wants to say that uh, jazz, the jazz, uh, that South African jazz, there is South African jazz which is not influenced by anything. That that is, uh, I will never be able to to believe that. Uh, <laughs> to try to exclusive, to you can't be exclusive about jazz. That, South African jazz has got no other attachments from other places. We just came out with it. No way. There was no way. If 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 we would came out with it, we were uh for me just to play the way I'm playing today, to have Maskanda going inside jazz and inside the changes and chord progressions is because I learned and listened to all of that. So uh, listen, there is no such thing as completely not influenced by, and that becomes <laughs> art. No. So I'm very glad, and also I like, I sort of like uh, what Mom Dorothy said, though it shocked me a bit when when she said, "Music has no place. You can't pin it down." <laughs> she said, "That's when she starts yeah. talking. She said, "You can't pin music down." To a place, and 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 I was like, hey, wait a minute, uh, and 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 now I'm thinking, of course, because you cannot pass pin the people down who are singing and who are playing, they can go anywhere. That automatically means you can't pin the music down to one place. It travels; it can travel like wind, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, and I was very glad. And about that as where she's coming from and and that. But it was a funny thing that and Bani Rachabane coming coming up with the, the cooking pot and what oh. what yeah. You know, so I think everybody was talking really from the heart. And I think uh, I would rather be off the track talking from the heart than trying to intellectualize. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Babeki. Thank you, Babeki. Can you please cross over your Nelisa to Nampundo um, Kaluva Kiankis, please? And then we will come back. If you have any questions, please prepare them and then um, you can ask them after this, the after we play this video. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Nomfundo Kaluva Kiankis. I am a jazz musician, um, a vocalist, um, songwriter, and I'm a senior lecturer in the jazz studies department at the University of Cape Town. So I, firstly, just to give some background to my own artistic expression, I, I'm a scholar of music. I started playing the piano when I was 12, uh, classical piano lessons, and I've been a student of music since. And so um, I have my roots firmly in, um, in classical music initially, and then sort of started to, to study jazz late high school into university. And for me, in terms of, you know, my identity in the music and the music that I write is very rooted in who I am um, as a Mkosa and as a woman. And I try not to overprocess. Um, my musical identity because I think it just it comes naturally to me um, by virtue of being true to who I am but right with all this kind of diverse training um, in terms of styles but um, I find that my music is very very rooted and grounded 
in, in myself. And that comes through in terms of the content and the languaging, um, the rhythms, the chord progressions and, and the melodic sort of lines that are very reminiscent um, uh, of, of South African music, you know. So that's just a little background um, in terms of my own art and my own work. And it continues to be a work in progress. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, having watched the, the documentary, um, it was very interesting to me. Firstly, I love listening to legends sit around a table and have this kind of discussion. It resembles one that happens a lot in, in the classes that I teach at the university, because these are very pertinent questions. Um, and I'm not entirely sure whether we'll ever reach a consensus in terms of how do we define South African jazz? right mom dorothy challenges us to say that there isn't anything called south african jazz there's just jazz you know and then dr jonas guangwa says yeah but actually we play jazz with a south african accent and here jazz is our traditional music but just played with western instruments um and all of these things are all right you know and that's the beauty of jazz is that it's a democratic art form and therefore it means that we are free to express how we interpret it you know, at all times, and that uh, we've got it offers us that freedom. You know, as a as a music that is a soundtrack to uh, liberation struggles, it's the one art form that we cannot, as a people, especially as Black people, feel like we are imprisoned by a particular, you know, kind of thinking. If anything, jazz breaks us free. You know, but the one thing I think that um, Uput Beki Koza said, which is indisputable is that jazz is an improvisatory art form and that we cannot escape, that we cannot deny. He's completely right, you know. Um, in jazz expression, you know, is rooted in improvisation and this idea that we're creating in the moment, in the now. And, um, and I think that's incredibly important. Uh, in terms of how we can empower teachers to bring these topics into spaces, you know, where young people are wanting to learn about jazz and wanting to be exposed to jazz, I think it's important that we don't um, dwell too much on these kinds of, uh, on, on, on these discussions that don't really have an end point, right? We need to look at this beyond these discussions and think, how can we incorporate jazz into the history curriculum. So instead of thinking about teaching music or teaching jazz, we teach history. And jazz is a natural and very pivotal uh, and integral part of South African history. And so we should not separate them, right? And we can do that in very, depending on the age group of the pupils that the teachers are teaching, you know, you level it out and you phase it. And so at a basic level, very fundamentally, you can say, well, in 1960, you know, the Sharpeville massacre happened. And these were the songs that accompanied that period. You know, in 1976, the Soweto uprising happened. And these were the songs that accompanied, you know, that period. You know, one comes to mind, Soweto Blues, written by Hugh Masekela and sung and recorded by Miriam Mageba, right? There's so many of them. And when we are able to attach music to historical events um, and periods, you know, it's a very powerful thing. And we start to look at jazz in very different ways rather than focusing on its theoretical underpinnings, which are incredibly important because it is a language. You know, it's a feeling, as someone said, I think Mamdoro said, it's a feeling. You can't write, you know, this idea of notating a feeling. You can't write a feeling. You can't write a feeling, but jazz is a language. You know, it's got sentences and structures and grammar that um, that one must learn in order to speak it, you know, and that we cannot deny. And I think that's where academic spaces come into play, right? But I suppose that's not the nub of the discussion today. Um, so, yeah, I think that's incredibly important to think of jazz and South African jazz as history. So when you teach history, use jazz to illustrate, you know? Um, and then further to that, 
what is jazz beyond it being a musical art form? What, is, what does jazz represent? What are the tenets of jazz? It's a democratic music, right? It means that all of us as band members or ensemble members have equal rights in this ensemble. And when we improvise, we're not improvising at the same time, meaning that we can start to teach young people that we don't have to talk loudly and shine all at the same time and, and speak over each other, that jazz teaches us to yield and to listen, right? To listen to what the other person says, try and absorb, absorb it and understand it. And then once you understand it and you get a sense of what they said, you can then contribute, right? It teaches us patience and tenacity. Um, and jazz teaches us resilience, but tolerance. And I think it's, those are very sort of important life skills and character skills to impart to young people. And I think over time, we are getting more and more bogged down by desperately wanting to define in very set terms what South African jazz is, you know? It's a music that's got a rhythm and a polyrhythm. It's got music that's got these chord changes. And it's, you know, and the third chord, you know, has to be an inversion chord. And then it's a one, four, five, or it's a one, two, seven, and a blah, and a blah, and a blah, right? And those are all, those are all legitimate. But I think if we're trying to, um, to really get to the nub of how this music has shaped us as a people, we have to think differently about how we teach it especially if we're thinking school level, right? At university, obviously, the intensity is cranked up because then it becomes quite theoretical, um, you know, and, and harmonic structures and so forth. But we also don't want to take the feel. And also, we don't want to over-sanitize and, and make music and make jazz like an elitist sort of music. Jazz has its roots on the street, right? And more and more, we're finding that jazz venues are in urban areas now and where people can't reach. And so we need to start thinking about how we take jazz back into the street and how we make jazz more accessible again. You know, um, the worrying trend that I've observed is that jazz is becoming more and more abstract, you know, kind of like the music of intellectuals. And it's, it's like very sort of, you've got to be, I don't know, otherworldly to interpret it. And while I'm not shunning that kind of artistry, I'm also feeling like jazz can also be simple. Jazz can be a song that can be sung anywhere by anyone, right? And that jazz is not clever people's music um, or people who speak English or people who go to this place or that place or live here or live there. And we've got to safeguard, we've got to guard against that. Um, you know, and I think once we start to use jazz and think about it in those terms of how do we bring community through jazz as an art form, right? How do we teach young people this music, but also whilst teaching them this music, we're teaching them their history, their, her their heritage. And beyond that, we take it to the next step of who were the people who wrote this music, the greats, the forefathers, the, the foremothers of this art form, right? And if we can encapsulate all of that under the banner of South African history, and then there, there's no more division so much of, well, that's music, that's history, that's geography, that's this, that's that. How is it that we amalgamate them to be one thing, right? Because uh, <clears throat> we have to find innovative ways to teach. The internet is moving at a very incredible uh, pace. So... I think we need to start looking or relooking or reconsidering the discussions that we have around jazz, you know, and try and move away from discussions where it's like a war of intellectual superiority and rather kind of just bringing it back down to the basics, you know, that what, what do you think when you hear Yakali Ngomo, right? Um, what do you think when you hear Murwa, you know? What do you think when you hear... Um, uh, Huma Segela's music, you know, when you hear, uh, when you hear Miriam Makeba, you know, uh, what do you think when you hear La Kuchoni Langa, Makei Davashe, you know, what do you, what do you hear when you think, you know, what do you think when you hear um, all the greats, you know, Mom Dorothy herself, you know, Mom Abigail Kubega, you know, Satima B. Benjamin, you know, Mom Tandy Klassen when she sings Sophia Town, right? When, when Mom Tandy Klassen sings Sophia Town, you literally can, you can almost smell and feel 
you know, the sadness in the forced removals of black people from Sophia Town. And when we start to think about jazz and teaching it from that perspective, that it is the true marker of our history, you know, we stop wasting time on discussions, you know, and debates that have no end point, right? Um, and so that's that's my take. I really, yeah. I mean, I I, I listened to to the conversation uh, in the documentary, um, and I'm just kind of adding on, and I'm thinking about how we can move the discussion forward. Um, I'm not particularly troubled by the idea. I think Prof. Fitzroy opens the documentary by saying something, you know people who report on jazz are not people who play it. And I'm not particularly troubled by that. I don't think it's an, it's an anomaly for people to write about subjects that they don't necessarily participate in or practice, but it's not to say that they are disqualified from writing about them. You know, people report on the news, you know, they don't have to be the news, but they can report it. And so, that doesn't bother me. I know a lot of people, it bothers them, and, and, it, and that's also a very legitimate concern. But I think we need to start thinking more broadly about how we teach this music um, and how we empower ourselves so that we find the true meaning of what jazz is and what jazz was and what jazz will be in many years to come. You know, So, yeah, I'm going to end it there um, with the firm and fervent belief that the other speakers will contribute um, greatly to the discussion. Thank you so much for having me and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Bye. That was Nomfundo uh, Taluva Janchis. Um, but now I'd like to take questions. If anyone has questions or if not, can we move to defining South African music, hoping that all of you guys are gonna stay. You won't be long. It's just going to be an introduction of the manuscript, a uh, couple of speakers, um, and then that's it for the day. Do you have any questions to all our great musicians that are in the house, or of our speakers that delivered such a nice introduction, or should we take it to defining South African music? I think. I think. Um, I would maybe just like kind of mention two things based on what Nomfi said. Um, if that's okay. Sure, Kirsten. Um, she said something about, Nomfi said something about hearing before having to formulate. And earlier, I recall saying something about lineage, you know, hearing someone play before you even, you know, came to your instrument or decided, you know, you get to start. Like for me, before I just decided, I heard somebody. And what she hearing before, you know, you know, your like self-expression, a lot to do with music and all other arts. Thing that I want to say, um, she said, she, about hearing things stopping first and the, and I think why um Nomfundo is so bold and she's such a bold scholar was you know we um our job first of all you know as people who you know have come I mean students who come under the institution our job is to study the streets like Nomfundo said you know and to listen first and I think sometimes you know, the streets kind of have, when I mention streets, I don't mean like literally, like just figuratively, like in terms of music, you know, the unschooled side of music. I think um, there's that line, you know, where people think, oh, this is like, this is what music is like on that side. And yes, they are right, you know, in terms of the institution, like, you know, the linear way of thinking, someone mentioned it, you know, earlier in the discussion, but actually it is our job you know, um, as music scholars or music students to study, you know, cease to listen to them and then kind of also at the same time increase our knowledge, our writing skills or our, you know, anything that has to do with the learning side of being able to formulate, you know, this music so that we can, um, how can I say, that we can be, and we can learn clearly from the streets while being able to um, 
make it applicable to us and accessible to us, you know? Yeah. So I think, especially, you know, when I, the last thing I want to say, when I get into um, conversations, especially with um, not all the elders, but like older people in the music industry, I can learn so much from them. But I think sometimes, um, not just with old, with the young people as well, like there are times where people forget to listen to one another and they assume, okay, you're talking about, you're coming from the institutional side, this is what you're going to say. No, this is not what I'm going to say. I, like we need to, if we can listen to one another and just listen finally and maybe just, you know, think, okay, like, you know, this is this is why you're saying that. Like, Numfunda, I'm sure a lot of people, there are a lot of points we can agree with and some people have a lot of points that they will disagree with, with what Numfundo said. But I think everything she said based on, you know, jazz being a democratic, you know, society, each one has their own experiences. And if we make space for that, you know, that is the only answer there is, you know, the, because there are many questions that will be left unanswered in the near future itself. So yeah, that's all I want to say. Thank you. Uh, all right, I see no hands, I see no unmuted mics, so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to thank uh, Vatoni Sidras, I'm going to thank Rabeki Koza, Snazo, um, Matthias Kirsten, and Nomfundu Napsensia, um, and then try and move a little bit to the books. So apart from honoring artists in the program, we've also um, uh, we're also here to assist art and culture teachers with material, right? Um, and some of these teachers they've showed interest in in learning and receiving um, um, teaching materials by South African artists. And all the films we've shown um, here on AdSet, they come with workbooks, including the one that we just screened now, Jazz Conversations. They come with workbooks uh, which provide further background to each film. The workbooks include essays by the writers is here, Cornelis uh, Osibo, Atia Khan, Ben Bechese, Bungwe Etlekiso, and the late Sisini Lepaba, Ogulu Parafala, and Zukiso Pakta. So if you're interested in films for educational purposes or if you're interested in the workbooks which come with the film uh, for your art centre, um, please write to inquiries at art and ubuntu, at ubuntu .org, uh, with your request. Um, just drop us a line and tell us what you're planning on using the, the material for. So in this part of the session, we will um, welcome Tuli Machos. Tuli, are you here? Because I do not see your name. Thank you. Is Tuli here? Pratoni, um, don't leave. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> don't leave. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Hi, hi, hi Tuli. Yeah. Oh, Tuli, you're here. Yeah. OK, so. Um, Hi, so we have Johannesburg based um, educator and music aficionado Tuluma Josie. Tulu was born and raised in the Val, south of Johannesburg. She is part of the farm uh, collective, a movement of African music collectors and DJs that deep love for music across genres. Tuli describes the music uh, that she plays as African folk, high life, African ancestral jazz, spiritual jazz, and malombo. And we also have, hi Tuli, and we also have Fanny Lesosibo, who's a writer with years of experience in journalism, covering topics ranging from labor to arts and culture. Um, so Sibo edited the arts section of the Men and Guardian newspaper and wrote copy for various period periodicals, uh, collaborative books, and client and clients in the creative industry. Um, Gwanele wanted to ask some questions, but we'll get to him a little bit later. Uh, before we get to um, Gonele and Tuli, I'd like for Bridget to give a brief introduction about what this um, defining South African music um, is all about. Bridget, can you unmute yourself? Hi. 
Hi, Zipo. Thanks very much for inviting me. I really feel quite shy to speak after that, the, the, the extraordinary speakers that have come before with their warmth and their wisdom. And when we were making the documentary series from which the information is drawn, which I'll introduce to in a minute, um, we grew to understand the, the Malian sage, Pataba, he used to say um, that when an old person dies, a library dies with them. But we grew to understand that when a musician dies, an orchestra, a whole orchestra dies with them. And so it was just wonderful to hear the knowledge that, um, that uh, particularly the, the, the wonderful conversation that Brabeki and Bratoni started with um, and, and the, the nuggets of very important jazz history that w was in the conversation. And at the same time, but the conversation flowed in a beautiful way, like a piece of music. Um, and at the same time, um, Numfundo's argument about jazz being part of South African history and why is it not, you know, that's very much what we discovered as well when we were making the various films. Um, before I go on to talk about um, the defining South African music manuscript, I'd like to just acknowledge the presence in the house of um, filmmaker and writer and intellectual and artist um, and poet, Imru Bakari. He is, you, you've probably heard of his film, if you haven't heard of him. It's a classical film on South African jazz called Blue Notes and Exiled Voices. So a very big welcome to, to Imru, um, comrade and friend. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about defining South African music. So, um, Literally, you know, 20 years ago, Abdul Khadr and I um, did a music series called Rhythms from Africa, in which we tried to understand how the, the music of, of some cities was created by the people who created those cities. And we started in Zanzibar, where we met at the Zanzibar Film Festival together with Emru. And the, in, in Zanzibar, there's this music of Tarab, which reflects the, all the different musics that have come to Zanzibar over the millennia and they come together in the seamless seamlessly played music of music of tarab and we thought well let's see um because abdul Khad is from malia and this music is very familiar to him and i said well come to south africa let's see what we can explore in south africa i live in cape town and i love the jazz of cape town and so we tried to do the same thing in cape town and we tried to do the same thing in johannesburg and we also we we finished films on all those those places those urban centers we, we began a discussion about one in Durban, but we didn't have, have the money to continue with that. But we did finish films on those on those um, three, three centres. And in the process, we heard musicians and we came to understand the enormous body of knowledge that musicians carry in their fingertips, not only musical knowledge, but social knowledge, historical knowledge, societal knowledge. And... We also found that they that certain musical terms would trip up their tongues, but we would find that one musician would define it this way and another musician would define it that way. One musician would say that Cape Jazz is this, and another musician would say that Cape Jazz is that. And another musician would say that Marabi is this, and another one would say it's that. So we we defining South African music is essentially Abdul Qadir trawled through all the interviews with the musicians and then put together what they did to try and come up with some understanding. So I'll just um, read for you the introduction um, that I wrote to this compilation of interviews. And one of the reasons we did it was just to, to uh, not to have a last word or defining word, but to continue the discussion so that this um, knowledge that we'd been exposed to through the making of the films could appear in another form. So I'll, I'll just explain. So all these films that we've been showing on Artsat um, are, have been made in a series called the South African Arts Past and Present. And the South African Arts Past and Pre Present Project seeks to deepen understanding of the indigenous sources of South African aesthetics and address the dire need for teaching materials on South African arts. Um, while making these and other documentary films on African music, we came across many different definitions of popular South African musical genres. We were not able to find a handy published definition of South African musical terms, yet these terms, Marabi and Bakanga, Kwela and so on, tipped off the tongues of the musicians we interviewed very easily. 
So we felt it was worth excavating the filmed interviews to find the ways in which musicians had defined these terms. So the words in this manuscript are drawn from interviews with South African jazz musicians and music aficionados. Um, the director of both series, Abdul Kader Ahmed Said, compiled extracts from the interviews. And we share these extracts from the interviews as a contribution and an incentive towards a larger intellectual and documentary project. This project is needed in order that the gaping holes in historical records and understanding of our extraordinary musical heritage are filled. The thinking behind the first series, Rhythms from Africa, as I've explained, was to explore how new mixed forms of musical sounds had been created in South Africa's cities by the mingling of different peoples who came to the cities through migration or trade, carrying with them the knowledge of indigenous musical forms. Um, so, for example, in Cape Town, we filmed Klopso, we filmed lay choirs, we filmed um, Christmas choirs, we filmed um, Moko village um, music, expressing African music, which informed the jazz in Cape Town and so on. And we found that jazz was the one musical form <laughs> everybody understood in Cape Town. That was the, the musical form that combined the city of Cape Town. Um, so um, this angle alone, i.e. of the various indigenous folk musical forms brought to the cities is deserving of further in-depth research. But the series focused on the creation of new mixes and mixes which express the unity in those cities. And so just before screening some of the films from South African arts past and present in Limpopo and Mpumalanga in 2019, um, in fact, just as an aside, we started by going to community art centers to screen the films. And then when COVID happened, we um, hit on the idea of doing webinars and that's where Arts Artsat came from to share to share them more broadly. And it's been absolutely extraordinary having these the speakers that CEPOS curated um, for the webinars because we've had these beautiful magical experiences like we're having today. But anyway, so we were still at that stage trying to go out to community art centres to show the films and the Sunday Times published a map of South African musical forms. We thought, oh, this is interesting, South African musical forms. And astonished, we realised it did not feature a single one of the forms described here. It focused on Amapiano, Gum, Kwaito and House. And it explained where all over South Africa you could find these, these different musical forms. So when we were confronted in Polokwane with an audience of young people, we were a little afraid that the series wouldn't touch base with them. Yet one episode of the series captivated them, and this was Big Voice Jack's, Aaron Jack Larole's brilliant musical storytelling. Dexterously playing not only one, but sometimes two penny whistles, he demonstrates Marabi, Bakanga, Tabataba, and Quella, interspersing his performances with tales of youthful aspirations, adventures, and wit whip witty manipulations of police under apartheid. So for example, when he was arrested, he played, um, what's that song? Um, Seiko Boss, Seiko Boss, anyway, and managed to get away with, with, without being arrested, without being you know, imprisoned because he didn't have a pass. So alerted by the Sunday Times article on South African musical forms, we realized that the film on Jack LaRolle presented an entirely unknown set of musical lexicons for this generation. And at question time, we explored the young audience's opinions. Enthused by Jack's personality and musicality, they conceded that there was value in getting to understand his musical history. And I think this underlines Dom Fondo's point about jazz is history and history is jazz. Um, and there were even teachers in, in, in the session who said, we can use this beyond our arts and culture teaching. We can use it in, I think there's a subject called social studies or something. So very encouraged by the appreciation of this musical heritage by these young people, we take pleasure in sharing through the, the manuscript defining South African music, the words of musicians who speaks a profound language the unified language of South Africa is music, but whose insightful opinions are very rarely heard. And once again, I'd like to say I stand very humbled to be in the company of some of the great musicians and some of the great young intellectuals who, who've spoken today. And um, thank you, Zipo. That's all I have to say for the moment. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you for the introduction on the book. Um, we will probably to run a little bit over time. Apologies for that. Um, uh, and so I think before we maybe hear more from our guests, I would like to um, 
call forward to uh, Tula's very interesting collection of South African music. <laughs> I guess <laughs> music in general, right? Um, um yeah. Um yes. Um to be honest, I can you, can you switch on your camera? I can't see you. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> switch on your camera. Okay. Can you see me now? I'm mute. I did. Can you hear me? Hi everyone. Yes, we can hear you. Hi. Hi. How are you? I just want to touch on what Mrs. Nongfundo Kaluba just said about um, music um, being a part of history and how we can incorporate that in classrooms because it's very important what she said and I just want to start there a little bit. Um, how we teach history in schools is very discriminative because we are excluding people like Abu Mira Magera, um, Hugh Masikela, people who are banned. And we are only focusing on comrades and people who are in the political sphere, which maybe that's where our first mistake was when introducing um, music um, to um, in the classroom, right? Because there's there's no connect between the two, you know. And going forward and defining how we can teach. Um, music and jazz. I think that's where we need to start. We need to start by correlating the two and saying that in 1960 this is what happened, and simultaneously, while the Shogu massacre was happening, Manuel Magera was also fighting in the UN, you know. And that's the knowledge that is not taught in schools, and I think that's where we need to start. Yeah. People. I'm here. I haven't left. Yes. <laughs> okay. Now that's where I wanted to start. What was your other uh, question again? Also, I'm wondering, do you have any questions for our musicians? Uh yes, yes. Um, we had to beg because uh, um, you know, mentioned that the feeling that where the blue came from was more of a feeling of being blue, right? And the feeling of um, being sad to say or sorry. And that just shows the feeling of expression. And I want to know that when he creates music, uh, what expression is he expressing to us that we might receive from what he's making? Uh, should I answer now? Please <laughs> answer now. I think this is going to be the perfect time for us to kick back the, 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 the conversation before we go to our oh, panelist question. Yeah. I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. You know, uh, after after we landed, uh, when I got into New York in uh, 1990, uh, I was surprised uh, by the fact that there was a lot of uh, hobos there uh, at the Port Authority in the station, people who were hobos. And also, uh, the just the state of the Black people uh, in, 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 uh, in America. Somehow, I used to think that uh, the, South Af the Africans were the only ones that were still oppressed. Uh, given the magazines that one was exposed to that were coming from America, they used to uh, to be a magazine called Ebony, uh, which used to talk about basketball players, the stars, the movie stars, and it was coming through the the uh, the American embassy, and it portrayed like when you thought of America, you thought this is a place that has democracy, this is a place that is free, this is the big apple and what. But when one got there, I realized that, oh, no, no, the people are just suffering, you know. So I remember the, my first impression there, the very first song I composed when I was there, uh, and also coming from South Africa, was 
I used to think if I leave South Africa, that would be it. There would be freedom anywhere else. And 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 that did, and when I went there, I, I realized hey, everybody, the in Ghana, the black kids are suffering wherever they were. I put them in Haiti, in Jamaica, or in in the islands, they are crying. Mm -hmm. So I did a song called can I turn to? Can I turn to? Can I turn to? Can I turn to? So in the so in the by a color, so in the by a color, so in the by a color. Can I be homeless in the land of the plenty? How can I be homeless in the land of the plenty? How can I be homeless in the land of the plenty? How can I be homeless in the land of the plenty? Go to Nabi. Go to Nabi. Can I turn to? And where can I turn to? Go to turn to. Where can I turn to? So, this is the song that I, I did right away. Uh, after after we were already free looking at the looking at the inter in the in the independence uh you look at uh, what you call here in Cape Town uh, that kind of housing in uh in a place that is already 25 years free uh it's it's it, it, it amazes you as to should you go and should the place who must go so uh, th those problems. Now, what I was talking about, the blues. Uh, the blues term uh, in America, it did not come as a form of music at first. It came as a, start, uh, as a state uh, of uh, existence. So there, uh, even there's a term that I was listening sometime uh, to a group from America. It was called the Sweet Honey and the Rock. Sweet Honey and the Rock, these were female singers who once came to South Africa and we met them also in Namibia. And they explained exactly that the, these were musicians who were singing spirituals. And they were saying something that uh, sometimes if somebody is sitting worried and saying, man, what, are, what, what is the blues about? You know, and also don't bring your problems to me. Your blues is not my blues. You see, so before it became a format of a musical expression or a musical term, it started as a social term. That's what I was saying. Now, around uh, 19, around 1986, uh, we did songs like Tear Gas. Uh, when people were tear gas, I used to do a song that I called if I get any gun, it can't go away. Take us, but it goes away. Take us, it goes away. Take us, but it goes away. If I get any gun, it can't. It goes away. Take us, but it goes away. Take us. That came out of the in one of the commemorations of of 1976. There's one commemoration that happened around the 80s, uh, maybe 1986, where now you remember that the organizations, freedom, uh, the independent organizations, the freedom struggle was banned. They were banned. And then somewhere in Regina Mundi, there was this commemoration where there was a Zappo. Uh, 
ANC. There was BCM movement. And as we said, we, we went up into Regina Mundi to commemorate 1976. The speakers were actually downing each other, you know, from Azapo to BCM, uh, to IFP, to UTF. They were looking down upon each other and they started fight, uh, mono, monopolizing the time of the microphone that time. And when we were coming out, the, 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 the soldiers were sitting outside on the hippos and they started to announce that everybody must go home, announcing to people who were already leaving for home. And, and it, that announced the people that these people are, 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 are focused on us everywhere we are. And then they started throwing sneeze gas to disperse the people and they started to do rubber bullets. They started to do tear gas. A few weeks after that, some kids were, they were affected by the tear gas, some of them into total blindness. You know, so when I saw that on an, a magazine I was called Learn and Teach, uh, I saw that I was in that meeting, we ran from that meeting, but some people were affected who were sneeze gassed, who were tear gassed, uh, rapper bullets and, and, and all those things. And I did the song then called uh, Tear Gas. So uh, now you listen to you, Masagela, uh, going, let, uh, let them walk. I want to see them walking hand to hand in the streets of Soweto. All that is history. All that uh, uh, was history. So I do agree uh, with Nemfundo when she says that some of the things, uh, the musical uh, analogy should be actually taught as a history because it depicts the things that were happening at a certain point in time. You know, like uh, now, uh, we, we recently had uh, what, the COVID. Somebody 20 years to come should be able to hear if somebody sings about COVID and be able to see what was what was about that and when was that happening because music is part of uh, documenting uh, history that's what uh, that's all i can say for you thank you okay. uh, thank you truly as i said earlier on um all these films they come with with a workbook and the workbook also includes historic timelines and essays by um, the seven writers that I mentioned earlier. One of the writers is here, Kwane uh, Lesosibo. You have some questions, and I'm wondering if you have comments also. Hi, Kwane. Uh, hello. Uh, hello. Am I audible? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, OK, thanks. Um, yeah, I guess my question would be for uh suppose the musicians in the house you know um it was kind of twofold but i'll see if i can maybe compress it and make it one um so i can't remember who pointed this out but they in the conversation somebody said that you know the the advent of the label sheer sound uh the impact that it had on south african jazz was that it kind of um, commercialized it uh, for consumption purposes. Uh, and so it had a, a very big impact in terms of the sound being very respectable and sort of constrained. Um, what I wanted to ask was, um, what, what would you, um, would you, Bab Koz and uh, Bab Sidra say has been the impact of that uh, in in maybe the current uh, uh, South African jazz, has, has that had a lasting impact? And has that impact been uh, positive or, or how would you say that impact has been? Um, and the reason I'm asking this is because it's tied to, to the history of how we look at South African music where it seems like uh, in some ways it was driven very much by a desire for people to record this music so that they could make money out of it. Um, so I'm just kind of looking at this uh, because it was something that happened more or less, you know, uh, at the time of democracy. 
what what was that impact in terms of what the music sounds like now um and my other question which kind of goes hand in hand with that would be have the social conditions of of the country today um <clears throat> How have those impacted? Uh, and by social conditions, I'm also referring to the conditions that musicians play music in. So it would be the availability of venues and the politics of getting into those venues. How how has that shaped the expression of the musicians? Yeah, I think it's basically those things. Thanks, Colin. Did we get the question, Breton? Uh you know, we have to change the uh, <clears throat> curriculum of how we teach. Number one, uh, we have to we have to teach what the student how you put together the hands and what you what the student actually bring, and you must actually study what the student demands from your teaching or what it has naturally on its body to play that instrument or. Uh, that must change in the tertiary in musical education at home. Is the formula we use is too Western. We have so so big of an archive of how to teach organic or holistically our students, and we just avoid that because it's a short-term formula we have on our university is about jazz, jazz, and we forget about how much information we have. Uh, being uh, from all the different cultures we have, how it happened that we are so away from our original sound, like the Khoi sound, uh, the Bakangas, the Zulu, the Pedi, the indigenous sound, we are completely taking that out of the equation. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing you mentioned about Sia Sound, is that the, uh, the company called Sia Sound? that brought out all this jazz music. Because I remember I had a, a recording session with Cassandra Wilson at Sia Sound in New York City about oh, three or four times. And uh, they promoted that thing you were saying about the jazz bringing it to us or to whoever. But it was more monetary or more making money with it or putting it in a, a category of a, what you call it, a, 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 a brand, branding it. Uh, we are so much into that today, still uh, branding our Cape Jazz or our South African music. We forget the part. We are dealing with a symptom. We are now dealing with our history of how, how, how where the gold is in our music. We are not dealing with that. We are de dealing with the periphery of what makes things uh, popular and where we can make the quickest buck within this democracy of, uh, <laughs> of uh, capitalism. It's all in there. Got to have money to have a good house somewhere or go to the university. That has got to stop because we are too many marginalized areas in our country and the infrastructure is not geared towards what we're talking. It's still there in the West and how much uh, money you can, and what uh, birthday your, your child can have to go to the best university. That must be cut down to the normality of just learning from one another. Uh, I don't know what else to say about that. Uh, I don't know if I covered any yes, of your concerns. Yes, I can go on there from it's you. So, I mean, the way we teach is so important. We are still teaching the, the Western way. We have the great eight theory of music of England. Even our language, the way we explain to our own people, it's through that prism of uh, explaining how kids what is a two four bar? That's got nothing to do with our curriculum that we can really uh, read from our own people how to establish it and design it. I had a student, uh, uh, Cornell Engelbrecht from the uh, University of Stellenbosch. He's so proud of him because he picked one of my pieces for his thesis. And it's going even further back as what I did. He went. <laughs> It was almost like a jazz kind of piece, but it took it way back to uh, the origin of the sound, what I was trying to say. Anyway, those kind of interactions with our students and, and our people, our kids, our musicians, our artisans, it's not there. We are still following that Westminster form of, <laughs> of learning. 
which is not too much of a bad thing, but we have to move. We have to wean ourselves more towards of what we really have and that the world don't really know. We have a secret here and only us can manage that. Uh, in America, England, they have their own markets. We are still uh, forming our, our thing around that markets. We have our own, I mean, that's why I look up sometimes in Nigeria, they have the biggest form of influence of their Afro beat music. It's coming down in a, in a force because there's that gap they can see, you know, with the population and migration. So uh, I think I'll stop there if I make any sense to you, my brother. Can I get Indeed. a response from you now? Yes, sure. <laughs> hey, but thanks for the question. And uh, thank you, guys. Biggie, I need to speak to you. I have your numbers. We will talk now. You're mute. <laughs> you must also give me your numbers before before you go. You I know where to find you. I know where you live. Okay. All right. Yes, Using that, yeah. Yes, I wanted to touch on what the brothers Aguanela is, is saying about yeah, sheer sound. Please. About sheer sound. You know, uh, sheer sound, man, I must I'm tell you right John away. John Sears, I met the owner, yeah. John Sears. Sheer sound, eh? Sheer and sound. I met the owner, yeah. Eh? In New York City, they have a, a massive complex, sheer sound, where they did what the brother was talking about, recording and archiving. Yeah. yeah anyway, you know, oh, they started. Yeah, they started with Bosim Long uh, to pump them uh, as, a spring, as an offspring. Uh, they released Bosim Long, but in most cases, the Share Sound. This is how they established themselves. In Share Sound. Uh, there was a program at SAPC that was mm. concentrating uh, at 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 documenting South African composers. That was a program which was at S at at uh, at SAPC with the radio station in, called SAFM. In now, Cape Town. In Cape Town. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, in C Point. SAFM. With that program, uh, SAPC was would sponsor you sort of like you would bring as a composer, you would bring the musicians, rehearse them. Right. And they get paid, rehearse and fees, and you record the whole album, you produce it, but not for uh not you forgot for, something. Yeah, no, not not forgot for, something, a can of you forgot yes, something, a for, can of for, what, what do you call it for <laughs> transcript so that uh okay. they, are able, they are able to play it on the radio, but not for commercial purposes. Right. That's what happened, you will record this album. And then the, it can be played from a, a, a radio station on a radio station. Now mm -hmm. they didn't charge you studio time because studios were still owned by uh, the, the recording studios were under SAPC. So they you yeah. they gave open uh, uh, studio time there. Now they recorded who they uh, they recorded Makoim uh, Hubata through that program. Yeah, uh, they yeah. record. Holly Hamner, they recorded Alan Quella, they recorded uh, Zim Nawane, they recorded Sipo Kumete, they recorded myself, they recorded yep. a whole bunch of musicians from that. And Share Sound saw that gap, and then Share Sound went into SAPC and asked for licensing of that music. Uh... They asked for licensing. You cannot believe what they were doing. They were they would go in there first, collect the music before mm -hmm. phoning you to come and make a deal with you that okay, we want to license this song. We want to like they right. were doing an album which was called uh Pagati and it's Castle Lager. This album had a compilation. Oh. It had a compilation. One song of mine, one song of Moses Mlelego, one song of yeah. Zim, one song, about 12 musicians in that one album at 1% <laughs> at 1% wow. royalties. So the the whole 12% <laughs> 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 
the whole the whole uh, oh man the whole eighty eight <laughs> percent is taken by them now SAPC yes. because those music that music was recorded at SAPC SA mm -hmm. they would offer SAPC ten percent sure. you see because SAPC actually sponsored that. So they and the yep. FNPC could not have the album for monetary purposes. So they said for our contribution, they were giving to SAPC 10%. But these guys would go there, Damon Forbes, they would go there and collect the music first. And then they call me musicians one by one to say, uh, there's a song of yours that we got from SAPC. Can we put it in a, a compilation? for a sign a dis, a dis assignment they yeah. say that for for yeah. three years they'll put in that compilation and can you imagine you have one percent of that yeah. McCoy has one percent zim has one percent moses has one percent then they <laughs> sell it, they are selling it international the, those recordings yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It's so they are signing they sign per song a, a deed of id but then they had a way of lowering you in into signing more than one song into oh. yeah if eventually <laughs> signing one song i've got a whole long story uh which uh, the, the share sound owes me nine songs till today oh, yeah. uh, the songs that the way they got them they had a way of getting this song so that you think you are signing for something else, but you are signing for something else. You think, because what happened, that song, if you do a song with them, they license it. After three years, if you don't notify that that, that contract must end, it, it already huh. collects another three years automatically. Yeah. So, oh man. So she has some reserves. I, I'm at local heads. I'm still at local heads with them. They are still collecting royalties from my, the songs that I recorded at SAPC that they yeah. licensed. They are collecting the royalties. And we, if you ask them, they want to challenge you in the court of law. Yeah, that's what they want to do. And it's, it's, it's very bad. It's very bad. They made a lot of, those guys seen... a lot of money out of musicians in South Africa. They ripped musicians off. Yeah. They're still ripping me off, which is Samro and those same people you're talking about. Anyway, yes. you've got a lot of information there, my brother. <laughs> I'm not, yeah, I'm not scared. Especially was asking. Yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not. Yeah, that's what this guy is asking. You, you, you those guys, asking. those guys are thugs. You're talking yeah. about sheer sound. You are talking about pure thugs. Uh, yes, I, I now, mean, look at this. You. These guys, they are able to go to Samro and put you and and, and 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 notify the music that you did not give them they go to sapc hey. and tell sapc you are their artist without you knowing yeah. and then they go to some they sign themselves into your compositions like 33 percent of your work oh. they sign themselves in at 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 at, at Samro. I tried to question that with Samro only to find that the guy who's doing publishing for Sam David Alexander, he's he's a, a, a is on the board of Samro, so you can't question. Oh. You, you can you you trying to? I went to report them in Samro to realize I'm reporting them at themselves. I'm reporting the, the <laughs> to his father. So don't don't yeah. tell me about Shia Sam. No no. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Sipo. <laughs> Thanks, Patoni. Cornele, you said it's right. Yes, yes. No, I, I had no idea how, how deep it went. Uh, I was just asking a selfish <laughs> question. Thanks <laughs> for bringing that up. This is deep, my friend. I'm, 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 I'm not finished with that. Oh. Okay. You are yeah. talking about tags. Really you, are talking, share sound. you are talking about pure tags. Tags at the <laughs> highest level. <laughs> um, Ati, you have a question. Do you mind unmuting yourself and asking the question, please? I'm sorry. I'm sorry to be cutting everybody, but there's a there's someone who has a question. No, I hi Zippo. Mamela, I, I I 
I actually wrote my question on the chat. So I don't know if please, can, someone can read it. Please share it. Please. Oh, so the question goes like this. I'm, I'm probably just going to read it. That towards the end of the apartheid regime, the liberation movement gravitated towards making a unifying national culture. And because of this, the concept of a South African cultural expression began to circulate or search for an aesthetic. And eventually that concept was canonized into the new dispensations cultural agenda. Uh, of course, historically and conceptually, the idea of South Africa as a national territory was itself distinguished by its refusal of or acknowledgement of the weight of the marginalized communities culture. Black musicians at some point were even uh, not allowed to play in interracial bands. They'll play behind curtains. You know, you've, you've heard stories like that. Um, but 30 years on, this idea of a South African cultural expression, I remember even South Africans, liberation movement activists having conceptualizing festivals around this concept of a South African cultural expression. But today, this term is no longer a dominant term as it was in the 90s, and it's no longer in circulation anymore. If anything, artists are challenging our very unproblematic acceptance of this label. I remember U Brazil Ngawana being fervently critical of this idea, Guti, you know, he's making a South African music. Right, he was very critical of this notion, but his music is South African, and I think it resonates with the the video, the discussions around this concept of accent that was brought up. Uh, and so, I, what I'm interested in asking everybody is, in light of this, uh, because I mean. In the 90s, nation building, nation building meant something completely different, right? Than it than it is today. So under what terms uh are we bringing or fostering uh artists to define themselves uh, in these ways, like, what is the compulsion uh, amongst us to still ask artists to think along this framework of defining a South African flag? Are we talking in terms of national building? Are we talking in terms of the territory? Uh, what is it behind uh, this concept today? So that's what I wanted to ask. If if I'm not making sense, I mean, I'll I'll be happy to 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 maybe even expand a little bit. I mean, I I'm not understanding the question as to what is the, the question actually. Okay, so Prabhupada. So as I'm saying, le, le, if you remember in the 90s, there was excitement around uh, defining and distinguishing South African cultural expression as a thing, right? There is this thing, Yoguti. There are defining parameters or distinguishable parameters of South African cultural expression in relation to say Zimbabwean and whatever, and that became a way in which South African art was marketed globally. But also, these were also concepts that were used by the state to bring people together, right? Um, and of course, at that time, there was a much more political, viable political consideration. So I'm asking today, in light of the problematization of this concept. Many artists saying, 
I I am a visual artist. I come from the space of visual artists. Artists openly refusing to uh, to narrow their their works along these lines. My work is not a representation. Cannot be narrowed down to South African art and so on and so forth. Musician Abu Zim and uh, and some of these people saying my work is not. Uh, so that cannot be narrowed down into this lane. So I'm like I'm asking Kyungoku, the 30 years on, in light of the challenging social situation, what if we say South African artists must define themselves along these lines, or South African music, South African visual arts? What are the reasons today? Are the reasons political? Is it nation building? Is you know what I'm saying? Is it oh, wait, pure embrace of the territory? Is it pure embrace of the national yeah. flag? Right? Um, what what is the defining point today that pushes us to define our music, our arts along lines, along the lines of a South African cultural expression? Uh, may I answer that? Or I think it's, you want it's to just go a first? byproduct. I think it's just a byproduct, the South African thing of I'm a South African playing South African music. If you're an improviser and play jazz, like you say, you open up the whole thing. That becomes part of what you really are. It's a small part. It's not for me. I've never been. I mean, how are we going to reach out to the, the rest of the world if you just want to keep it South African music? We are influenced by so many things within our country. So it's a contradiction in a way. You know, the, the jazz makes me breach that gap that we're talking about of wanting just to be is it a south african thing it's in your in your blood if you go anywhere it doesn't matter what you play it's gonna pop out but it's not the thing for me uh i just want to just add that in you know it's too much information man <laughs> uh, and intellectuality because it was such a simple thing you know too much intellectuality uh why uh, to, to today's uh, gathering, I can go back to what he was asking. What what is the purpose of today? Is education, man. That's all it is. Uh, we have been asleep at the wheel uh, with our music and taking it another level. Uh, that's why it's not just South African. It's it's a it's a whole uh, popuri in this country of people from everywhere and every corner of our southern. Hemisphere. Anyway, I leave it the rest for you guys to go further on this topic. And, and also, uh, uh, in fact, I mean, the, on, on, on my own, I would think that, uh, you know, I I do my expression mostly as a guitar player. And yeah. as a guitar player, uh, I'm playing in the, I see myself in a global space. Uh, so as much of course I will have the the what do we call what can I call it mm -hmm. I, I will have my own uh, native accent as, as I'm a, a, a musician but I'm playing in the world you know uh, I don't want somebody to define me as that as uh, if somebody says I'm a good guitar player I'm a just a good guitar player, not a good South African guitar player. Playing is good as what he's doing in a corner there, jumping around. No. Uh, I, I've got to be seen as a guitar player, just like you see uh, Pat Metzny, just like you see George Benson. You, you don't say George Benson is from Canada. He's for Canadians. He's, a, he's not condensed. He's just a guitar player. So uh, there is a, a musician for, that's why the, the, the word folk music is, is very dangerous to say you are mm. a folk musician, because if you are a folk musician, it means you are playing that marginalized sound in a corner there. Uh, oh no, the, the, the Mamba, Mambazo is, uh, they are very energetic. They are very energetic. Mawatila Queens, they are very energetic. That's what I even was hearing in America after hearing. And I had a as like Oma Singai, uh, who had just an incredible voice. 
regardless of whether she comes from Mali or she comes from Cuba or she comes. Just an incredible voice when she sang it that POPs, everybody was like, wow, what is the, what was that? You know, so there is a part of the the the, the music during the struggle uh, and the music during a post struggle, uh, there, there has to be an effect there. During the struggle, the musicians were utilized a lot to articulate the problems also of mm. South Africa, which was, which could be very dangerous. We could be, you could be a slogan musician without even seeing that. Uh, and where mm. you'll find out some of the people were more interested in sounding, uh, in sounding relevant, in sounding politically correct, rather than mm -hmm. the art for the for for the art sake of it, the art has to be beautiful uh, and high so uh, art, whether we are crying or laughing, mm. but it's to be at a standard uh, that is very high. So uh, there was a lot of support from uh, us musicians uh, for economic sanctions and everything. And that's why musicians today, up until today, they cry. They say, hey, we were utilized. But now when the ice cream came, we have done, we've been dumped on, on, on this on, on this side, you know? So <laughs> uh, it's, it's a very important thing uh, the, the, because music at first is an art, but and at another level is communication. So uh, you can be, you still have to be a good musician, whether you sing in CIA Pretoria or not. You still have to be good. Yes. Can I Thank answer? you, Papa. Um, yeah, uh, Kirsten, can you please comment? We're going to take your uh, your comment uh, before we wrap up. Um, that was so insightful to listen to Tony and and Becky. I think um Artie's, um question main question was the like the concept now behind like you know the music that the um you know maybe the younger generation is like playing and performing because back in the 90s you know the there was a lot of support you know and much more audience you know listening and paying attention to South African jazz whereas now I think um because we are given a new canvas you know as a younger generation we are given a totally new canvas we, we now have to paint our own story, but now away from struggle, you know? Um, yeah, I think that is the, the challenging part and to still be heard, you know, it's very, it's like a in-between struggle of, you know, saying something monumental through this art form, um, but also trying to gather, you know, the crowds to be able to listen to us because there is a message in the, the music, the South African, the so-called South African jazz music that is being, you know, performed today and created today, maybe more in a progressive way, but there is a message behind it. And it's a it's a message of a, a newer generation, a new, you know, new build is coming along. We're still trying to take the baton, you know, from our elders. We're still trying to learn as much as we can while, you know, being truthful and to ourselves, you know, and loyal to ourselves as to bringing across, you know, us, you know, our musical expression, what we believe, what we stand on now. Because remember, after the struggle, you know, we now have to build kind of like a new, not a totally new foundation, but just, you know, we have to find a way to be able to tell our story now um, apart from the struggle because we are a new South Africa and so yeah. And also we are very diverse. And I think that is why our music has become maybe a bit more progressive and progressing away more, more away from, you know, what the frameworks was. Because remember, we have a huge expectation on us, you know, like from outer continents, especially like especially because the the frameworks within our um within our institutions, you know, they're very much Eurocentric and so there's still that global gaze, like, no, South African music is this, you know, but actually people now need to listen and pay more attention um, to, you know, the new message being, a, you know, that we're trying to bring across. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so 
Thank you, Kirsten. Um, I, I'm not sure if there are other people with last words because we're about to close off uh, the session. And also, this is the finale of our set. Um, and so, if Prapeki, Pratoni, Guaneles, Nazo, there, you have any closing uh, comments. This would be the time, Bridget. Um, this is the final ad set session for the time being. Uh, if you also have a, um, a comment and would like to thank people um, or you'd like to direct people towards something, this would be your moment. Sipo, thanks for connecting yeah. me with Becky. <laughs> and thank you again. Sure, no. but you haven't left, Bratoni. I'm so sorry. We'll release you very soon. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, I got a story. Okay, you know, when, I first, when I first met Tony, uh, years back in, in Botswana, where he uh, was, was in Botswana, it was a concert. We met, mm -hmm. which I was on the time. Clicked, practicing, and I song song they were supposed to go and please carry it away with the improvisation in the songs by the time we finished we said now let's go concert the concert was finished <laughs> the concert was no longer there uh, that, <laughs> Another story. <laughs> another story. Prapani Rachabani. One day, Prapani Rachabani books me to play a gig with him at Melville. Are you? He had a he had a band by that time, you know, a mixed band. His band mixed to uh, black and white. So, <laughs> so, but for some reason, uh, some of the musicians, the musician could not come in into the gig the, until the second half. And he asked, me to sit, he asked me to sit in for until the musicians come. And we play the first set. And when they come in, his musicians, when they come in, they'll play the second, you play the second set with them. So after, but we played with Prabhupada and it was so nice. When the guys came, he said, no, man, let's all play together. Let's keep on playing together. We'll sort out the payment. And we yeah, were yeah. playing, and these guys were playing so badly. They were playing so badly. <laughs> and after that, I after the show, I asked Prapani, I said, Prapani, why you play with people? These people can't play to, to save their lives. While we are playing with yeah. these people, they are, they, are, they are very low in standard. He's, Prapani looked at me, he says, a block a hell, a war hell, a but I'm telling you now that is something I've never been able to go on stage, play with some people who plays bad and block them and not. This <laughs> <laughs> is no. A block, a block, a block. Thank you, Thank you, Becky. Bridget, nothing. Becky. Uh, so I'm wondering, Bridget, is that are you okay? Should we close this? You don't I'd, have like any just, I'd like to just say um a big thank to, thanks, thanks to Bridget. you because you brought such wonderful people together. It's really been so beautiful today hearing everybody <laughs> speak. And um yeah, thank you for all your beautiful curation of Artsat in, in, in general. Big ups to Zipo, thanks. And to all the beautiful speakers today, it's really been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, Tony Sidras. Thank you, Beggy Koza. Uh, thanks, Nazum, Jim, Kirsten Skippers, Matthias, uh, Katushabe, who's logged off, has left the building. Tulima Josie, thank you so much. Thank you, Gwanele Sosibo. Um, thank you to Nofundo Kaluba for your contribution, and thank you everyone for being here. Uh, thank you for contributing to Adset. Um, thank you, Imru Bakari, you've been with us since 2021. 
good to see you on the final uh, ad set session. Um, hopefully, there'll be more in the future. Um, you can go on YouTube. Don't forget if you would like to access some of the previous um, uh, sessions. And this current one also should be online maybe next week at some point. Um, and also, if you know of anyone who would benefit from the workbooks and films, please get in touch with us. Uh, there's an email on the screen, feedback at atubudu.org or inquiries at atubudu.org. Uh, we will respond to you. Thank you, everybody. But Tony, you get a chance to sleep. <laughs> sorry for keeping you up. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I will speak to you, my sister. I will get in contact with you. Don't worry. Sure, Please. sure. Good. I'm, I'm going to a gig. I'm going to a gig later on at 8 o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> Raise your gig. Okay, I'll give you... I know what you're saying. Athletic, social, athletic club, social. Yep. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. All right. Okay, and enjoy Enjoy the gig. Thanks, Cheers. Bye. Okay. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye, Bridget.